Um, thanks a lot, David. I've been doing this seminar series remotely for a few years, so it's really nice to be here in person. I thought I'd take advantage of the fact that um, I attended the e-research uh, conference down in Melbourne uh, earlier and the International Workshop on Science Gateways, and so I thought I was so close. It would be lovely to do one of these things in person for a change, and David was, uh, was uh, happy enough to accommodate me, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk um, a little bit about the Science Gateways um, program in the U.S. and kind of how it got started, how it how it developed, um, and where where the, some, some kind of recent developments, recent exciting developments going forward. So I started working with the Science Gateway program in 2004. So um, so a number of years ago now. So the world was very different in 2004. If you kind of think back to where we were as far as, you know, Google not being the leader among search engines. We had all these different types of search engines, uh, dog pile, mega crawler, Alta Vista, all these different things. Um, uh, Facebook wasn't around. Not a lot of people on the, the World Wide Web. We used to get these CDs from America Online to get online in the U.S. I don't know if you saw any of that here. So it was it was a really different world when um, when I first started working on things. And um, what we were doing at the time was um, we're starting to notice that the, uh, the science world is developing these web interfaces for science. And meantime, uh, supercomputers are sitting off here entirely separately from that activity. And um, what ought we to be doing to kind of bring those two things together? So how could you make these interfaces that scientists were comfortable using much more effective by having supercomputers on the back end? So previously, to get access to a supercomputer, you had to be you know, a pretty high profile PI, you write a proposal, you and your grad students get to use this great thing, but not a lot of general scientists get to use that and not a lot of general uh, students. So, you know, how can we go about changing those things? So this was really the first time, at least um, since I've been involved in supercomputing, that we kind of um, set about um, trying to attract these really new communities. Um, so, right, this was a, a new initiative for the TerraGrid. Um, and there was this kind of concept of TerraGrid inside. So we weren't designing any of these front end interfaces, but you had the power of supercomputing on the back end. And so what did you need to do um, to, in, to, to make that a reality? So since we didn't really have a program, what we did at the beginning was paid actual science teams to work with us to develop, um, to, to figure out what was needed. So a lot of these projects, uh, National Virtual Observatory, uh, Network for Computational Nanotechnology, uh, Neuroscience Instrument Gateway, these were, these came out of a U.S. Um, program called IPR, Information Technology Research, and what this was, um, and this is probably late 90s, was basically shotgun marriages between technologists and scientists. And, you know, today it's just so odd to think about that because, of course, technology is part of science. So much is digital. There's so much analysis um, um, that's just fundamental to all the different fields. But back then, that really wasn't the case. And so you are sort of trying to force some things. And it's interesting to look at some of those early projects uh, and see kind of what they've morphed into um, today, you know, years later. So these were the um, projects that we started working with. And you see there's a TerraGrid liaison column. So there was lots of hand-holding going on. There was, it was very, very personal relationships working with all these projects, um, trying to figure out what we needed to do to make TerraGrid resources useful to these projects. Um, and so um, we had this concept of requirements analysis teams or RATs. So this made for like several good slide series over the years. I have all kinds of great RAT slides. Um, there's, there's a shop in Paris, believe it or not, that has this great collection of stuffed rats in all kinds of different positions. So, um, so, so this was tremendous slide fodder, but it also kind of focused what we needed to do. So what did we need to, to change in terms of policies and accounting and security and software interfaces because if you think about it you know now you have these web interfaces that can be fairly anonymous and you're providing access to supercomputers so is that okay or not or what do you have to do for that to be okay you know how can you show that you're using these things responsibly all of that sort of thing so that's that's a lot of the work that that we went uh, that we we undertook um, kind of early on um, so a couple of the early successes from that program. 
So the Linked Environments for Atmospheric Discovery Program, the LEAD program, what this did was took radar data feeds and when the radar data warranted it, launched uh, high definition simulations on supercomputers to look at the development of tornadoes. So you need to model things in a pretty fine grained way to look at that actual cell development and you can't be doing that sort of all the time. So when, when ought you to be doing it and how can you can construct workflows in order to do that. So LEAD was one of those early Peregrine projects. And another one, and this one is kind of unique, um, neither of these two are going on any longer, and so I'll, I'll say a little bit about sustainability and challenges and things like that later on too. But this one was really unique in that it was a social informatics data grid. And so what this group had was collections, um, very valuable data collections of video streams, audio streams, things that included um, eye tracking and heart rate and and that sort of thing. So very um, unusual for supercomputing. Um, and what the group was doing was, so you were able to, social scientists were able to annotate these data sets and they're kind of looking at conversational uh, skills in Alzheimer's patients and kind of rec recognizing, you know, when it's one person's uh, turn to talk, when it's the other person's, what kind of annotations, uh, you know, you want to make in the process of this, this interview. Uh, so this was really kind of novel for us in the way of supercomputing, but it goes to show where um, you've got an interface that the social scientists are very comfortable using, and you know the the supercomputing is almost invisible. Kind of the analysis um, for the acoustic analysis, the statistical analysis using R, all of that sort of happening in the back end, so that a group who's not comfortable with supercomputing at all can still make use of it for their work. Um, so over the years, you know, and this this took a long time. We had some pretty early, um, we we had some pretty high expectations for this program early on, or at least um, uh, Charlie Catlett, the director of the TerraGrid, did. He had some really high user number goals for science gateways, and I was the director of the gateway program and was thinking, oh my gosh, I I don't know if we'll ever hit that, uh, and um, and we didn't during the TerraGrid. We have sort of since then because it really took it took a while to ramp up, and it took a lot of socialization um, and a lot of outreach to, to different groups to kind of move this off the. Um, off the, the landing uh, landing zone there. So pretty recently, um, you know, now we have a recognized program and we have services and it's very clear how a science gateway or a web portal can interface with supercomputers. And um, in the last few years, actually more users access the Exceed supercomputers in the U.S. coming in through gateways than they do logging in at the command line. So that's, that's a pretty radical shift for the program over time and you kind of see where it was. TerraGrid ended in 2011 so the beginning of this curve is about TerraGrid and so you see that yellow line it's still um, you know considerably under the login users um, at that point. Um, that recent ramp up that you see in 2015 um, we have one of the um, fundamental underpinnings of being able to use the supercomputers is the fact that um, the gateways use something called a community account. So if you're coming in through something called the NanoHub, all your users run as a user called NanoHub. And so in order to count how many end users are using that supercomputer, you have to tag your job submissions with a user identifier in order to automatically count that. Uh, finally, in 2015, that little ramp up is when we were able to do that automatically instead of just asking the PIs, hey, go through your records, how many users used uh, Exceed during this period? So a much more automated way of doing it. Um, so it, as you can see, there's still, um, still work to do in the program to get it. Um, you, you know, full, fully automated, but that was kind of a big step and that's the, the recent ramp up. Um, so today there's a lot of different uh, gateways that use Exceed and you'll see that they're from all kinds of different domain areas. And this has given us kind of a unique view of science gateways because all of these things are independently funded in the US. So there's not kind of a program um, it funds virtual research environments, virtual labs. They kind of spring up in many different sort of unexpected sometimes places. And so it's sort of much harder um, to corral them, but you also see kind of a lot of independent scenarios as far as what they're facing in terms of development and sustainability and, and that sort of thing. So 
um, it's given us kind of a unique view. So some of the highlights from Exceed, um, Cypress is a really big highlight. I think Mark Miller's been a speaker on this series probably previously. Yeah, he gives a really nice talk and he's done an amazing job with this gateway. Um, I think that the, the, there's several things that I like about this gateway. So first, that it serves top tier universities like the Harvard, Yale, Stanford, that sort of thing. But also the outreach to minority serving institutions and non-PhD granting uh, colleges. And because the only, the, you know, there's really no bar for using this. You set up an account, you give it an email, you give it a password. You can use this gateway. You can run on supercomputers. So very, very low um, bar. There's sort of controls at different levels with what you're able to to do, but I believe anyone can get on and use 30,000 hours worth of CPU time. So it's very open. Um, there's no restrictions on what country you're coming in from, uh, any of that. Um, what's also nice about this is if you see these non-governmental organizations, so museums like the Smithsonian, the Field Museum, Botanical Gardens, um, those are not typical supercomputer user communities, you know, at, at all. Um, so there's really broad reach, and then you've got your big institutes like J. Craig Ventner and the Broad Institute, uh, uh, very, very varied, um, and a whole lot of publications. So over 2,000 publications that cite the Cypress Science Gateway um, in the last six years, uh, which, is, which is pretty impressive, used in a lot of courses, uh, 76 courses. Um, and they really... Uh, uh, they really kind of, they're, they're a great example of this TerraGrid deep and wide um, philosophy. So deep, this was a cover of Nature from February 2016, citing the Cypress Science Gateway in the acknowledgments there, which is really great. Um, over there, you see the interface, which is pretty darn simple. Um, it's a very contained set of applications that you can run. They're very well tuned to run on supercomputers. So Mark will hear comments from his users like, it used to take me a month to run these things on my laptop. Now I get publication quality results overnight. So you're, you're really putting the power in the hands um, of the people. But it's a very, it's a, it's a pretty simple interface. Mark, Mark likes to think of it as the in and out burger of science gateways. And for those of you familiar with this great US institution, it does, well, it does, it does uh, one thing and it does it really well, right? Burger, cheeseburger, uh, Onion rings, fries, shakes, that's it. <laughs> this is Mark's idea, not mine. <laughs> uh, but but what the point is that gateways don't, don't always have to be really fancy with a lot of bells and whistles to meet the needs of the user community. It really kind of depends. Um, and so what I also like about this, and I'll blow up a portion of this um, screenshot in a moment, is at the bottom left there, you see a photo. This is the cover, of the front page of the NSF website from 2012. And there's a high school student down there who won his state science fair using the Cypress Science Gateway and had no interactions with supercomputing staff at all, had no interactions with the Cypress um, folks at all. He had a high school teacher. Um, who knew what he was doing, learned about the Science Gateway, got an account, walked the student through how to run simulations on there. Um, and Mark found out about it only by accident uh, when he was looking at usage logs and you know, saw somebody using a lot of time and hey, it was a K-12 email address and started you know, following the chain. But that's, um, to me, that's really exciting to be able to put that quality of tool into the hands. You, know, you talk about encouraging people in the STEM fields and keeping the best and brightest in the science in the sciences and kind of giving people those tools, I think is really empowering. So the, the contrast between nature articles as well as students in a single interface um, is, is really terrific. Uh, I got one other exceed, um, you're right, the network is a little slower, there we go. Um, uh, exceed um, uh, Science Gateway to highlight. And this one is looking at the land loss in the Louisiana, uh, Basin, and so they're they're losing a football-sized parcel of land every hour. And the um, what what you'll see that is um, is kind of a similar theme in science gateways is when you look at who the collaboration is among. So, earth scientists, computer scientists, uh, coastal engineers 
cross-disciplinary, we find that gateways can be very um, popular for these kinds of collaborations when you're bringing people from different backgrounds together to work on a similar problem, which you see more and more today. Um, that's where gateways can, uh, can, can really help. Um, another nice trend we see at the National Science Foundation is, the, 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 there we go, <laughs> is um, a call, a, a, a program that specifies the use of gateways. So when you think about gateways, they're kind of, they're fundamental pieces of infrastructure and they're not necessarily research projects or things that enable research. And so you really want to see them reused. And the fact that a program, in this case, a, a, a neuroscience uh, program as part of the Brain Initiative, is saying that you can use the neuroscience gateway. So you're proposing your research on top of this existing gateway. And that's, that's a really um, strong vote of confidence for gateways because these things, they're really cost effective, right? So you can run these tools through them. And that means that you don't have 150 neuroscientists downloading the latest version of Neuron, installing it, keeping it up to date, running a cluster, all that sort of thing. Now all of that's done for them and they can just, um, just use this gateway to do that. And so the fact that that's starting to be recognized in programs is really helpful, um, I think. Um, it's coming, there it is. Um, so because, because we saw so many different projects, you saw all those different logos from all those differently funded projects. In the Terragrid and Exceed program, um, I and my team, we, we started to see first similarities. Um, so we were bringing together these gateway developers because they were using HPC on the back end. But really, they liked to talk amongst themselves because they were developing these interfaces for science scientists and there was really no forum to even exchange experience and there's there's a lot of similarities it doesn't matter what tool you're running you might still have a authenticate you know similar authentication problems um, um, uh, analysis problems returning data to the end user visualization so there's a lot of similarities no matter what the field and people really just enjoyed having that forum to be able to talk to other scientific web developers um, and, and and then kind of um, uh, build on what others were doing. So I'll talk about how that's kind of turned into some recent recent initiatives. But what we would see was these things were funded mostly as three-year research grants. So you go into your funding, you have some early users that are on the proposal with you, you develop something, um, you know, great, everybody likes it, you start reaching out a little bit further, and right about that time, your three years is up and the project goes away. And so all those scientists who were using it um, are now disillusioned, right? So they've learned how to use this, they've maybe put a lot of research results in this gateway and now it's gone. And that's going to make them less excited about doing this again in the future and kind of hinder science in that way. So we really wanted to find a way to kind of um, stop this cycle if we could. So we did, um, we, we did focus group studies over several years, resulting in a very large survey that went out to 29,000 principal investigators, as well as academic CIOs and CTOs. And we got about a 17% response rate, which we understand is, is pretty good in these circumstances where we didn't really target the recipients in any sort of way. All it was was funding at a certain level, no proclivity towards the use of the web or anything like that. Um, so we wanted to look kind of broadly at how scientists were using the web. Um, and from the respondents, we saw quite a lot of variety in the sorts of things that, that people were using. And so that was really exciting. So across the board from instruments, uh, citizen science, data collections, computational tools, uh, really across the board. What we also found interesting was such a large percentage of folks were uh, played some role in creating these science gateways. So they might have been actual developers or principal investigators or maybe on an advisory board or a subject matter expert. But a lot of people were playing roles in the creation of these things and for a lot of different uh, types of applications. So this is a pretty diverse um, pie chart here. And, and that, that was pretty exciting too. I mean, there's a, there's a lot going on in this field right now and it's really exciting to be a part of it. One of the other things we also asked them about was the types of people that they had involved in these web projects. 
And so you'll see quite a diversity here as well. What they wished we had, what, what they wish they had in the blue and what they did have in the uh, light green or the, the yellow there. Um, so really quite a variety of expertise um, needed or wanted to do these things um, well. And this, this also kind of parlays into a future program. Um, so as a result of all this, our uh, National Science Foundation has a software program that spans from small research team software all the way up to software institutes. And so just recently, they've called for two um, software institutes. And one of, one of these is around molecular sciences, and the other one is around science gateways. So we were kind of thrilled with that recognition of the importance of science gateways to be one of these first two funded institutes. And these things are um, five years plus another five uncompeted if they're going well. So it, it's kind of a, a strong statement that NSF doesn't often do things for that long a period of time. Uh, so so that's, um, that, that, that's really exciting for gateways. What we're hoping is not just, we're, we're excited not just about the things that we can do in the Institute, but also the fact that other gateways trying to receive funding can point to this as kind of a, um, you know, an important um, hallmark of the way things are, are going. So anyway, we've come a long way since 2004. This is a, a, a U.S. cigarette commercial from the 1970s. <laughs> We've come a long way, Virginia Slims. Um, this is what the institute, uh, what the NSF would like this institute to do. And many of these are things that I've already talked about as far as giving gateway developers this forum to communicate. Um, also, one of the things that we'd like to do is it says educate developers on the next generation of investigators. So the web is just this, this totally exciting environment to pull in students. It's so dynamic. You can see the results of your programming you know, right away. Um, you can also apply that work to a lot of different fields. Personally, I think it's really interesting work to be involved in. You could be designing a gateway for a digital humanities project one day and higher education high energy physics the next. So it's really like as far as work environments and variety, um, I think it's great for students. One thing that's a challenge, at least in the US, is these things get developed at um, academic institutions. And so typically, um, at least at my institution, you get a grant for a couple of years, you need a web developer, you have to go find someone, you have to hire, you're scrambling, scrambling, bringing somebody in, and then that project ends, and then you're trying to figure out what to do with the people after that. So that's not a co really comfortable career path for people um, going into this space. So some universities have done a really good job of establishing kind of a core of gateway developers, because uh, most of your research projects are going to have some component of this. So if you have this pool of people that then you can hand out when all these different projects come in, it's much more time effective for the PIs. They don't have to do all this hiring. It creates a much more stable career path, and you're going to get better gateways out of it. And then you have a career path for your students to go into so that you're not always losing them to the Googles and the Facebooks and that sort of thing. It would be nice to have some of these people stay in the sciences and bring their skills there. Um, so if we can do things like that across the different universities, then things like job boards make sense and, and all, all kinds of things. You have, a, um, you know, maybe exchange programs across universities. So just trying to build up a whole ecosystem for gateway developers. Um, so these are the components. So the Science Gateways Community Institute was funded August 1st. Um, so that's, that's um, terrific news. It's been a long time coming, um, you know, 12 years since the since I first started working on this in the TerraGrid, but really a good five or so kind of working to get this to, to this stage. So um, um, for, for me, it's quite satisfying to see this, something like this finally, finally happen. So this is what we're actually offering in this institute. So there's five um, different components, and I'm going to um, just tell you really briefly about them. Um, incubator, extended developer support, scientific software collaborative, community engagement exchange, workforce development, 
Um, the incubator is really trying to address the problem when you saw all those different types of expertise that's needed to develop a gateway. You don't want to have to hire all of these people full time. You can't hire all of those people full time. So it's kind of like a startup business incubator where you need expertise, but only for little bits of time. So if people can share cybersecurity expertise or user interface to design or um, uh, or um, uh, Let's see, uh, graphical user interface design, also reliability, that sort of thing. Um, so, the incub so we envision the incubator giving people access to the, that type of expertise on a consulting basis. Um, and we've got some nice experts involved um, from cybersecurity to sustainability to evaluation, all the things that you really want to be thinking about when you first start a gateway so that you can get beyond those three years if this thing is successful once. Once these things go out on the web, you really can't anticipate how they're going to take off. Um, and if you haven't thought from the outset of, you know, what, what if we are really popular? What if the, you know, the scientists really gravitate towards this? What have we thought about in terms of our, our paths forward so that we don't have this folding up after three years and starting all over again sort of cycle? Um, so that's the incubator. Extended developer support is actually helping people one-on-one -on -one build gateways and teaching them how to do it in the process, right? Because you, um, you want to leave people with a gateway that they understand how to build and maintain and extend and that sort of thing. So this is actually that hands-on helping. The Scientific Software Collaborative, what this is, is a listing of active gateways that people can use, just things that are existing today that, that are available for anybody to use, but also software that you can use to build a gateway. So you could see, here's a functional gateway. This is what was used to build it. Uh, this is a developer you could talk to about you know, his or her work building that gateway. These are the technology that were used. So kind of a repository um, like that, because it's really difficult, as popular as Cyprus was, it's very much a word of mouth sort of spread. So somebody is giving a talk about their phylogenetics work, they mention Cyprus, somebody in the audience says, oh, hey, Cyprus, maybe I could use that. And it's, it's, it's you know, almost um, by accident that you learn about these things. So you can't really Google Science Gateway 4X um, very well and find things. So even though this is a job that won't ever be done, um, we think it's important at least to start. And there's um, several hundred of these that we, that we have already. Um, Community engagement and exchange. Uh, we've been doing an annual workshop on science gateways in the US um, for over 10 years. There's a series in Europe. There's a series that's just started in Australia recently. That's why I'm here, yay. Uh, more about that uh, in a few more slides. But just kind of uh, developing the community. I talked about uh, job postings and campus expertise. And also engaging internationally. I mean, that's another reason that I'm here is that gateways, um, there's exciting gateway development all over the world. There's a lot to learn all over the world and trying to um, bring that bring that together as well as um, in the U.S. interagency, um, our, our U.S. Department of Agriculture, the EPA, uh, the National Institute of Health, even the Department of Defense uh, all have science gateways. And there's not been a lot of conversation across agencies, um, at least that I'm aware of, so I'm hoping to change some of that. Okay, so we started August 1st. We're getting um, a lot of our systems in place so we can kind of keep track of all the expressions of interest that we're uh, getting. But this is one of our first extended developer support. So we're actually building a gateway from the ground up for Michael Cianfranco. And what I like about CryoEM, and I think this is the type of thing that we're going to be looking for in the projects that we undertake, is that there's been a rapid change in this field where all of a sudden the imaging is very much more functional than it used to be. And um, that necessitates HPC for user communities who are not familiar with that. So the development of a science gateway, it's got a fairly contained mission. It's got kind of a potentially large user base. And so there's a tremendous potential for success here. Um, these are uh, 
some of some of Michael's own words about this. Uh, so there are going to be many of these cryo EM centers coming online with this new instrumentation. So you have a lot of people who are now having access to these large data sets. Uh, Having an existing gateway is going to give them a path forward as far as where to go with their data, where to do analysis, where to perhaps share analysis approaches with other people. Um, and yeah, so um, right, incorporating workflows to guide new users through the processing pipeline, but also seeing those things you know develop as the field develops and having this sort of platform for sharing that sort of thing. So, um, so this is this is the type of thing that can have a radical impact. I think much the way um, Cypress had a radical impact on phylogenetics. Uh, so we hope to be doing many more of these. Um, it's the the expressions of interest even in these first few months have been pretty overwhelming. Um, it's a, the Institute's a big project, but when you start breaking down all the different activities that we have planned, um, it, it gets pretty small pretty quickly. And so, um, so we're, we're kind of, we'll be racing, racing to keep up, um, but, but, it, but it's exciting. Um, so for me, you heard me talk mostly about supercomputing. I've been at the San Diego Supercomputer Center for a long time. Caragird was a supercomputing project, so is it Seed. Gateways don't have to be just supercomputing at all. Um, there's clouds, there's campus resources, there's sensor streams, there's databases. There's all sorts of different things. I haven't been able to focus on those things as much because of the funding. I always had to do things that were related to TerraGrid or to Exceed because that was the program. Um, but now through this institute, we can do a lot more. So this is really exciting that we can kind of broaden our horizons to the much, um, the much wider, wider world of gateways. And so this is just a completely... Um, off the wall example that doesn't involve supercomputing at all. Um, Sage Bio Networks is a nonprofit and they have a computational platform used by citizen science teams to crowdsource questions in biology and medicine, like they say. And so here's a Here's an example. And some of these, so uh, someone from SAGE participated in our focus group studies and we were kind of developing this whole idea for the Gateway Institute and where we needed to go. So it was really nice to talk to some of these different non-HPC um, groups. And, and so what they're looking at doing is helping to improve uh, modeling for, uh, for mammography screenings. And so, there's you know, an analysis of these images and it's not as good as it could be. And so they're crowdsourcing uh, uh, competitions to come up with better algorithms for modeling these things. And so they have participants from all over the world. And this is one of their dream challenges. They have several that are going on simultaneously. So it's just a nice example for me of, um, uh, of sort, of, sort of non-standard to me HPC. So uh, some other examples of, uh, of, of different gateways. So NEON is, is very much a, a sensor data uh, gateway, a very large um, project in the US um, around the environment and environmental monitoring and that sort of thing. And so there's, here's an interface to, to be able to get data. Uh, this is for volcano research, and so you see some of the resources that they have access to are online simulation tools. So that's a gateway. This isn't one that I'm familiar with as far as using, you know, TerraGrid or Exceed or anything like that. But they they're probably using clouds, campus resources, that sort of thing, uh, educational materials that are shared, uh, presentations, links to publications. Uh, this is a NASA um, interface to data collections, aerosols, atmospheric chemistry. So lots of different, um, and Galaxy, which actually does run some on Exceed, but also runs um, on a lot of different environments. So it, it just, you can see, you know, how that list of gateways is going to get very large very fast because there's an awful lot of great stuff going on um, everywhere. 
So this, um, this is what I was talking about as far as this registry. So this is a list that we assembled really just kind of out of our back pocket for one of these, um, one of these proposals where anytime I ran into something at a talk or I heard about it somewhere, we'd like throw these things on a list for science gateways and then kind of categorize them by, um, by, by field. And so this is, this is a list really without even trying. So, I, you know, to me, it sort of demonstrates the need for one of these registries so that you can search these and not just by keyword, you know, maybe there's recommender things, uh, you know, really following the model. I actually heard a great talk at the Gateways workshop. Um, on Monday about you know the need for additional um, search features besides keywords so you're in Amazon you're looking for a product you know is that product in beauty or books or music or it's sort of that subsetting or if you like this you might also like this or you know so and so is a hydrologist and he liked this data collection that had the keyword water in it so really how do you how, how do you get smart about this um, this listing so that'll be a nice challenge There we go. Um, so, so if we're successful, so what does the world look like five to ten years from now? Um, you know, we have a vibrant community for gateway developers. It's a lot easier to get started creating gateways. Uh, we have some stable career paths. And, you know, I, I could see radical changes in how research is conducted, and I'll say a few words about that in a couple of slides. So these are just a couple of things that I'm thinking about beyond the Institute. Uh, the nice thing about getting an award of this nature is that you get approached by a lot of people who are smarter than you are in different fields. Um, so this first bullet is from someone who's really studied um, sort of how breakthroughs are made and kind of I guess there have been a lot of studies over time where if you assemble you know a smart team in the room and you know ask them to solve a problem that's not necessarily the best way to solve a problem that having kind of an open more participative environment um, can lead to more innovative work and so I haven't done a lot of research in this area but other people have and I think gateways can really kind of uh, play a role in, the, in this sort of thing. So we're, we're interested in working with groups like this. So what, um, you know, what, what kind of impact does putting these great tools in the hands of a high school sophomore or, you know, people at um, a more underrepresented university, how does, how does this really kind of change the shape of the research? So that's one area I'm excited about looking at. And the other is there's a lot of talk about reproducibility in science and being able to tie data to publications and things like that. Gateways, I think, can play a great role here. And we're just starting to have some initial conversations with the, um, the whole tail team, which is looking at this kind of pipeline between data and publication. Um, and also the Mozilla Science Foundation, Center for Open Science, those sorts of things. Because of the contained environments of, of gateways, you can capture when something was run, what the atmosphere or what the environment was like when it was run, um, keep those logs so that someone can go back over time, um, uh, at least theoretically, and reproduce those same results. So I, th I think we can play a big role here too, and that's, um, that's kind of exciting. Uh, a couple of other just about final directions. Um, the other nice thing about working with gateways is the, the constantly involved, evolving nature of the technology. So Jupyter Notebooks, um, Fernando Perez is giving a keynote at our gateway workshop in about three weeks. Um, and if you've ever seen a demo of this, of, of Jupyter or IPython, um, to me it's just so compelling because these things seem to spring up just so easily. And the fact that you can create essentially your own gateway and share these notebooks with others and that sort of thing, I think is just really, really compelling. And so looking at those a little more carefully, um, from a high-end perspective, you know, what if your, your data sets are really pushing the limits? What if your computation in these little code snippets is really pushing the limits? What kinds of things can you change behind the scenes there to make these uh, more effective? That's pretty a, a, an exciting direction, I think. And finally, um, we see a lot of gateways now interfacing with other gateways. 
So Cyprus, for example, there are uh, others who have their own environment. They would just like to be run, be able to run these Cyprus codes through their environments. So what kind of API interface can there be to Cyprus? What kind of API? We see a lot of gateways using things like the Protein Database and uh, our data bank and pulling that data into a, an existing gateway. So having gateways share resources across and be able to query and incorporate um, SIGAP is an example where there's API interfaces to get basically basic gateway building blocks like authentication uh, and data transfer and things like that. Um, Agave comes out of the iPlant project and that's also a popular API interface that's being used by a lot of different gateways. So, so this I think is also an area where the Institute can play a role um, kind of publicizing what's out there a little bit and understanding that space a little bit better. Uh, that yet yeah, the international collaborations that I talked about, um, we have our series that's been going on for some time. Sandra Guessing's been organizing an international workshop that's been going on for some time. And what we've been doing is jointly publishing in a special journal issue. So that's been a really nice way to bring the communities together and also give um, gateway developers an opportunity to publish about what they're doing because it's not always appropriate for a research journal or a computer science journal. It's sometimes difficult to find the right space. And so we've been happy to be able to do that um, collaboratively for the last few years. So in order to be sort of a, a little bit more thoughtful, like stepping up a level from these individual projects like the Gateways Community Institute and Nectar's Virtual Labs and um, the EU's Virtual Research Environments Program, we're just starting, this is just starting to bring together um, groups internationally to kind of step back a little bit and provide some leadership on where the science uh, gateways as a field are going. Uh, first, kind of facilitate awareness between what's going on um, in so many different places because th there are a lot of different terms used for science gateways and that's, that's, that's okay, that doesn't bother me at all. There's a lot of definitions for what they are. Um, that doesn't bother me either, but just kind of being aware of what's going on in all these different spaces, that's one of the things that we're trying to address here. So. Um, uh, one of the first things we're doing is working on a white paper on the impact of science gateways. And I think that this will do a lot to kind of promote research investments um, at a lot of different um, countries, hopefully.